On April 1st, 1986, police officers found an elderly man named Raymond Kelly dead from stab wounds in his car outside a Miami bar. A gun he had in his car was missing, too. Stealing the gun was a possible motive, but oddly, the victim was missing both ears. Either a signature or a trophy for whoever the killer was. Months later, it would turn out the killers had cut one ear off, dropped it in the dark, and then gone back to cut off the second. With the possibility of a serial killer on the loose, Miami PD sought out similar murders in the area. It didn't take long. The cops found two similar recent murders. One was a Vietnam veteran stabbed while in a motel. The other was found dead in a park. The park and motel were close together. Both Caucasian males, both missing ears, and the victims were alone as well. Two weeks after Kelly's murder, a black man was killed and had an ear removed. Multiple killers were involved. This time, someone left their fingerprint on the door jam, but no matches turned up. Later in 86, there was an incident at an Opelika apartment complex. Two black victims both shot to death. The cops arrived on the scene fast and started asking questions and looking for the perps. One of the suspects was still around. A towering 6'3 frame taking a piss in an alley. He was arrested and taken in for questioning. Earlier that very day, there was a dispute at the complex, and some of the residents caught the news to report an issue with new residents. Two black men caught on camera ranting about their issues with their new neighbors. The Nation of Yahweh, a new religious movement that was revitalizing poor black ghettos and had a spotless record with local authorities, or at least that's the facade they put up. The news crew packed up and left. The men on the broadcast were executed hours later. That was the day Anthony Brown and Rudolph Broussard refused to move from a housing complex the Yahweh's were about to purchase. I'm going to stay here until I get eviction notice. I don't care what they say. I do, because they ain't going in. Just as simple as that. Ten hours later, after quarreling with staff wielding Yahweh men clad in white robes, Brown and Broussard were shot and killed. This Yahweh disciple was arrested and confessed to the murders. Back at the station, it turned out that the suspect they caught was Narah Israel. He claimed to be 404 years old and had no memory of his life before conversion. They discovered four knives and a white robe in his car too. The white robe instantly pointed to the nation of Yahweh. Something strange was afoot. Narah's fingerprint matched the one on the door jam from the previous murder. But as far as the most shocking revelation that night after running his fingerprints that came back is Robert Rosier, a one-time St. Louis Cardinal, Oakland Raider, and a UC Berkeley star football player. Only a handful of people from Alaska had ever played in the NFL. Robert Rosier was one of the first. He was born into a military family, and they soon moved and settled into California around Sacramento. Rozier grew into an athletic sensation at Cordova High, a star defensive end and one of the best at that. A teenage Rozier could high jump six feet, seven inches, vertical jump 10 feet, sprint the 40 yard dash in 4.7 seconds, and bench press 375 pounds. Despite his athletic gifts, Rozier was a poor student and had a 1.32 GPA, effectively ending his prospects of making it to a D1 college. Rozier went to Grays Harbor College for a semester, then somehow made it into UC Berkeley. Now UC Berkeley has extremely high standards and it's hard to get in, but a coach violated NCAA rules and got Rozier in. Rozier basically only went to religion and black history classes and someone else would do his other classes. On the field, Rozier made a name for himself and multiple athletes described him as the best athlete on the team. Off the field though, those who knew him recalled his pathological line, that he had a gun, used coat, and his pit bull named Nig. Ironically, Rozier portrayed himself as very religious. In his African-American studies classes, he became enlightened by the works of Dr. Harry Edwards, a man who focused on careers of black athletes and a former consultant of the 49ers and Golden State Warriors. Rozier realized it was plausible that white owners were using black players for their bodies. After that, he wanted black players to boycott the 76 Olympics. That never happened, 
but it was a pretext for his future radical views. While at Berkeley, Rozier moved into his own apartment in Oakland. His new crib turned into a palace of sex and cocaine. He was even picked up by Sacramento police for contributing to the delinquency of a minor during this time. Regardless, his coach turned a blind eye to the bad rumors regarding Rozier because Rozier was a standout star, their best player. In the end, he was removed from campus before graduation. The reasons were unspecified. In spite of dropping out, Bobby Rozier was still drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals in the ninth round of the 1979 NFL Draft, 228th overall. Rozier played as number 75 for six games in 1979. Though he started in none of them, still stuck in his bad ways, he was let go by the St. Louis Cardinals due to problematic behaviors, drug use, and petty crimes. Also, he had a terrible season for the Cardinals. No interceptions or tackles. The Cardinals had a terrible season that year. Five wins, 11 losses, and they finished at the bottom of the NFC East. Still considered a capable player, Rozier played for two different CFL teams in 1980. First playing for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, then the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. The Tiger Cats won the season that year, but the Rough Riders had a horrible season with two wins and 14 losses. While playing football in Canada, he wrote 30 grand worth of bad checks and had 32 warrants against him that one year alone. With the RCMP looking to arrest him, Rozier left Canada never to return. Back in the States, he signed with the only team that would accept a reject like him, the Raiders. In fact, Rozier is not the only serial killer that's played for the Raiders. Rozier's time in Oakland only lasted two weeks. He vanished suddenly, and teammates thought he went to Africa. The Raiders won Super Bowl 15 that year regardless. Bobby wasn't actually in Africa as presumed. For whatever reason, Rozier went on a tour of the U.S. stealing credit cards and doing drugs. He was busted for a carjacking, and that earned him six months in jail. Robert Rozier disappeared to most who knew him after that. The destruction of America was set in motion the moment they brought niggas to the shores. You take one of our people out of the ghetto and move them into a white neighborhood, and inside of a month to three months, it's a ghetto again. And any man that has a solution to the black man of America has a solution to the problems of the world. I come with a proven solution. The Nation of Yahweh was founded in Liberty City, Florida, 1979. The nation's temple, a large, flat-roofed complex, was once a supermarket and a food stamp center that caught fire in the 1980 Liberty City riot that rocked Miami. It was a prime time to start a racist cult, too because of racial tensions from the recent Miami riots caused by white police officers beating Arthur McDuffie to death and their subsequent acquittal. The main tenets of the nation of Yahweh were that blacks were the original Hebrews, Jesus is black, and white people were the cause of black people's struggles. The nation of Yahweh portrayed an image of social reform and was highly active in the community. In the 1980s, they had over 12,000 members a net worth of $250 million, opened several businesses, and revitalized broke neighborhoods. They had high social standing for this. On the inside, the nation, like many other cults, brainwashed desperate people and featured things like members giving up their possessions to the church, extreme punishment for any type of disobedience, and ordering members to participate in crimes. Yulon Mitchell Jr. was their leader. He named himself Yahweh Ben Yahweh, meaning God, Son of God. Yahweh was radicalized by his childhood and racist experiences in Oklahoma. He learned how to preach from his father, a Pentecostal preacher. Yahweh became a member of the Nation of Islam in the early 1960s. He was removed from the group in the late 1960s for corruption allegations. After that, he became a prosperity preacher for about 10 years until he was sued for fraud by his congregation, and his business partner was mysteriously murdered. At this point, he made his way to Miami, and found that the nation of Yahweh. Yahweh had mastered the art of swaying poor, desperate, and lost people by now. Yahweh had a good image in Miami, was even given a key to the city in his own public holiday, but he still had some critics. When he was accused of brainwashing black people, Yahweh responded that he was washing brains of white supremacy. Yahwehs were militant 
and select members were known to walk around with hidden machetes for any threat of violence. Yahweh himself had a circle of 10 as personal bodyguards and an inner circle named the Brotherhood, comprised of tall, strong, athletic men, the Death Angels. Enter Robert Rozier. Likely homeless and lost, Rozier wound up on the steps of the Temple of Love in 1982, sometime after his prison stint. He took the name Narai Israel, meaning child of God. Over the next few years, he became very devoted to his new faith and was eager to join the Brotherhood and impress Yahweh. To join the Brotherhood, Rozier would have to kill what Yahweh termed a white devil. Any white devil will do, and to bring back a body part of his victim were his instructions. In April 1986, in the Miami neighborhood of Coconut Grove, Rozier followed a drunk white man to his apartment and killed him and his roommate with his sword, a 12-inch Japanese knife that members of the Brotherhood would carry. On September 5th, Rozier and another Brotherhood member killed Raymond Kelly in his car while he was asleep in a bar parking lot. Fifteen days later, Rozier and three other Yahwehs killed 45-year-old Cecil Branch, a black man stabbing him 25 times for defending his mother after she refused to be extorted by the nation. Rozier also killed the war veteran in the hotel, a man in the park and a panhandler who annoyed him. He threw him in the water after. On October 27, 1986, the nation of Yahweh bought a five-building apartment complex in Opelika, Florida for $480,000, about $1.2 million today. The nation claimed that they were trying to improve the property, but members spent their week attempting to evict residents from the rest of the complex. On October 31st, the two whistleblowers were shot dead, and Rozier was arrested. After Rozier's arrest, the media was all over the story. Rozier was facing death for the murders. He chose to fight the case, and the nation of Yahweh even hired a really good attorney for him. After seven months of no progress, Rozier asked for a different lawyer. Fearing he might snitch, Yahweh publicly denounced Rozier as a liar and excommunicated him from the church. Was he a close associate of yours? No closer than you. Well, I'm in the media. He must have been an enemy of yours in that case. Apparently. I mean, was he one of a close, small circle of people? No. He I don't have a close, small circle. My circle is Yahweh. How did you feel about what happened there? I'm against murder. I don't teach murder. It's obvious. But Robert Rogier says he was taught to kill. He's reported to be cooperating with federal authorities, describing his role in an elite circle formed for the sole purpose of eradicating Yahweh's enemies. The group's name has its origins in the Bible, where God's assassins were called death angels. Have you ever heard of the death angels? I read about it. Do you have any? Do I have any? No. Yahweh has plenty. Rozier felt betrayed and decided to snitch on Yahweh after this. In Rozier's testimony, he revealed shocking details describing murders and how he'd walk the streets looking for unassuming white people to kill. In court, an unremorseful Rozier confessed to seven murders but was only charged for four. Snitching on Yahweh secured him a 22-year deal. Members of the nation started to inform on Yahweh and the nation too. The testimony shocked everyone. One was a story of about a member that argued with Yahweh and Yahweh ordered all the members present, including children, to beat the man to death in front of him. Another, a case of beating a disobedient member with a dull machete and firebombing a black community in Del Rey Beach. The nation was charged with more than a dozen murders. In the end, Yahweh was acquitted of murder after Rozier's testimony was discredited. Yahweh and 15 others were charged. Yahweh only got 18 years for murder conspiracy. Bobby Rozier was paroled after 10 years in 1996. Now Robert Ramsey is under the Witness Protection Program. After prison, Rozier denounced violence and expressed regret for his actions. He had two children, ran an auto detailing business, and did web design as well. Unfortunately, Rozier hadn't denounced check fraud. Three years later in 99, Robert was arrested over a fraudulent check. When he was busted, Rozier told them exactly who he was, thinking they wouldn't blow his cover over a bogus check. 
That didn't work at all. An investigation found Rozier had written over two grand in bad checks. What would have been a misdemeanor was now being treated as a felony due to the fairly new three strikes law in California, something that came into effect in 94 while Rozier was in the pen. He probably had no idea. The three strikes law basically allows a new life sentence, even if the third offense isn't a serious or violent felony. Robert was held on $10 million bail and sentenced to 25 to life. Despite his very undeserved and fortunate second chance at freedom, Robert Rozier has spent the entire 21st century in prison over some bad checks. <laughs>